Well, good morning and welcome to Retro Church. So if you've been with us the last few weeks, we've been in this series titled Good Grief. And today is our third and final part of the series before December begins and we get into the Christmas season. Anybody hyped? Who has their Christmas tree up already? Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, let me just say that this is a time of year that it is really, really easy to invite someone to church. There are no like secret tips and tactics that you need to use to convince people to come to church because just being Christmas is enough. In fact, statistics show that 83% of people would come to church if a friend or family member would personally invite them. And so I'm not going to put you on the spot now, but I just want you to think of the last time that you personally invited someone to church. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, maybe it's been a while, but here's the thing. If you love God and if you love retro, we need you to invite people to our church. So would you be willing to make yourself maybe feel a little uncomfortable in an effort to make an everlasting impact in someone's life? In fact, I think that it's fair to say that it would be selfish if we were to keep all of this to ourselves. Last week, someone in our church shared uh, one of our church social media posts online, and they told me that it was a big deal for them to share because it was uncomfortable for them to do that with friends and family watching. They didn't want to look like a weird church person. And maybe you felt that way before too. That's okay. Well, they did end up sharing that post, and what happened was someone unexpectedly started asking questions about the church, and that person came last week with their family, and they said they're definitely going to be coming back, and so that's worth celebrating because there is power in the invitation, and so I just want all of us to commit to inviting people to church, not so that we could just have a packed house, but so that we could populate heaven. Are you guys with me? Yeah. All right, let's pray before we get into it this morning. Heavenly Father, I'm just so grateful for all that you are, I'm grateful that your spirit is in the room today and that we could come excited uh, to worship you, to learn more about you, to take our next step towards you, Lord God. And I pray that as we get into the Christmas season, that celebrating Christmas, that drawing near to you for, for a holiday wouldn't just be a one weekend thing, that it wouldn't just be a one week or one month thing, but that it would be a lifestyle. God, I pray today that we would be able to, to walk towards you in a new way and just be revitalized, God, that you would just give us new breath in our lungs, Lord God, that we could lay our, our burdens down at the foot of the cross, God, and know that you are willing to pick it up and carry the weight. Like we talked last week about, about being yoked to you, that you give us the strength to carry on, that you guide us on the path, Lord. So I pray today for those that have come in here, maybe as a wanderer, maybe they've been going through life and feeling like, I'm just going through life. I pray today that they would have a renewed purpose that could only come from you, that they would have a renewed vigor and joy and love and peace that could only come from a Savior. God, we just love you. I pray today collectively we could take a deep breath and walk towards you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Before we get started, check out this old commercial quick. <gasps> Hello, beautiful. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hi, Anthony. How much did my discount double check save me? About 150. Done. I don't have State Farm, but insurance, find me money. I got you a dollar. Oh, you almost had it. You gotta be quick. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but sometimes that feels like life, doesn't it? Like, like you are so close to turning the corner. You're so close to taking your next step. Like maybe the promotion at work is like just out of reach. Maybe you're, you're so close to graduating, but this one class is crushing you. Maybe you feel like, you know, the, like things are almost going to fall into place and you'll finally be able to get in a good rhythm of life and maybe just have a more consistent relationship with God. And then just like that commercial, our life goes, oh, you almost had it. You got to be quicker than that. It's like, are you kidding me? Good grief. And so today we're going to attempt to like land the plane of this series. I don't know if I can, but I'm going to try. And the first week we discussed ground zero, right? And how all of us have this place of impact or destruction in our life. But that same place of destruction can also be a place of reconstruction. That ground zero could be a place of joy and pain, both death and life. And then last week we discussed being frustrated and faithful. That just because you're frustrated with God does not mean that you're losing your faith. And we discussed how we could pray and talk to God with honesty when we're sad or mad because life is really hard sometimes. We all have experienced moments in our life where we find ourselves at the end of our rope. And the truth is, is that Jesus is the only one who could hold any of this together. And it's often that at the end of your rope, 
At the end of your understanding, at the end of your own abilities, that's where we find Jesus. So point number one today is this. You will have trouble. Real encouraging, right? You will have trouble. I think it's important for us to understand that, that we don't have to get to a place where things are okay to believe that God is good. What I, what I mean is it's possible for God to be good even when things don't feel good. And so I want us to consider today, how is it possible that grief could be good? Because what we know of grief is that it's not fun, it's awful. However, the truth is, is that grief is also unavoidable. How do we know this? Because Jesus himself said to his disciples in John 16, verse 33, in this world you will have trouble. And the disciples might have been thinking, well, gee, thank you, Jesus. But I think it might be a better marketing strategy if the motto wasn't about having trouble and something more like, in this world, if you follow me, everything will be great and you'll never experience pain. But no, instead, Jesus says he's honest. And he says, listen up, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to go through some difficult things. And then he says in response to that trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The King James Version says it this way, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so Jesus is saying, yes, yes, you are going to have some trouble. You're going to go through some tough things, but don't let it get you down because I've conquered the world. And you could be at peace regardless of your circumstance because Jesus has already won, because he's already defeated death, hell, and the grave. Regardless of what we have to endure in this life, the victory is ours in the end. Amen? Amen. In this life, Jesus said, you will have trouble. And then in Matthew 5, verse 4, he says, blessed are they who mourn for they will be comforted. Jesus says, blessed are you even when life is terrible. Blessed are you even in those moments when things feel like they're broken, when they're, when they're falling apart, when things are out of your grasp. Blessed are you in moments of desperation and heartache, for Jesus says you will be comforted. Well, how could I be comforted right now? I mean, you have no idea what I'm going through, Pastor Mike. You're right, I, I don't. But Jesus does. In fact, I think it's actually a common misconception in church sometimes. There's this expectation for a pastor to be the comforter when it's Jesus. The expectation for a pastor to play the role of Jesus. And so just so you know, right from the jump, it is not my goal to make you believe in and follow me. It is my goal to make you believe in and follow Jesus. And so my hope here today is to help us understand that maybe we don't need to avoid the places in our life where we're at right now. That instead we can learn to have hope and gratitude in all circumstances in this life. That's less about Jesus being like this emergency escape hatch out of where we're at, but instead that we let Jesus into where we're at and let him do the work that needs to be done in this season because there is no wasted season with God. He is constantly trying to teach us and draw us nearer to him. And I know that sometimes we could like come to church with this attitude of like, I'm gonna go to church today, but like, I don't even know if I'm believing this. I don't even know if this is gonna fix anything anyway. And what I want you to take hold of today is that wherever you find yourself this morning, God is right there. He is right there with you. And so are we. At Retro, you don't have to leave everything you're carrying out in the car before you come in and throw on a fake smile when you walk through those doors. You can be honest and transparent here because we are not interested in faking it until we make it. Remember what we said last week, that we can't heal what we won't reveal. So again, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. But I think often we tend to live in this get over it culture, right? Like we are, we are too busy to take time to mourn because we're always on to the next thing. When it comes to tough things in our life, we try to avoid it or resist it, put a happy face on and pretend it's not there. But the truth is, is that if we ignore those things, we will never, ever find the good in it. Because the path to gratitude and thanksgiving is not when we avoid grief, but when we let it do its work. We don't experience joy when we avoid grief. We experience joy when we face grief head on and come out on the other side. So again, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And God knew that we were going to need instructions and a way through these moments and these seasons. And so today we're going to look at a book in the Bible called Lamentations. And this series, this, this book is a series of five songs, songs that were written by the Israelite people who were left behind after the Babylonians carried off a majority of their population into exile. And when the Babylonian empire came in, they destroyed the temple and they tore families apart. It was devastation unlike anything they had seen before. And there's this entire book, these five songs that we're left with here, that they're just trying to sit and deal with the grief, the acknowledgement of what they had lost. They're thinking, you know, we had God, we gave us, he gave us hope, and he called us out of slavery into freedom, but we pushed him away. We had families, we had a great city, we had a temple, we had a community, and now it's all gone, and we're just left with the pieces. 
And so we're going to look at a couple verses in Lamentations 3, and it's actually right in the middle of these songs where they're, they're living in this tension of like moving forward a little bit in faith, yet falling right back into the reality of their circumstance. And maybe you felt that way too. Like you trust God and, and you want to put your faith in him fully, but you still find yourself chained to the reality of what you're going through. Lamentations chapter 3, starting with verse 19, it says this, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. I well remember them, which just means I remember them well. If I could be completely transparent with you guys, I know sometimes people can look at a pastor and think like, oh, his life is probably pretty smooth. Or, or people might put a pastor on like a pedestal like they are holier than thou. That is just not me. That is not our church. And I'll just be completely honest with you guys. About nine years ago, my wife and I, we went through something in our marriage, and it required me to do all that I could to earn her trust back. And so in the beginning, I was completely in the doghouse, and, and I deserved to be. And then a year went by, and she trusted me a little bit, but not completely. And then a few years went by, and I remember feeling like, you know what, I'm just not that person anymore. How much longer is it going to take for you to forget what happened way back then? But the truth is, is that we don't have to work hard to remember the hard stuff, do we? Like the negative stuff does a good job of just staying right in the forefront of our minds. In fact, sometimes we have to work really hard to forget the hard stuff. But you don't have to work hard to remember it. And the writer in Lamentations is saying, I remember my affliction. I remember my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. Gall basically just means disrespectful behavior. And not only do I remember them, he says, but I remember them well. He's saying it's right in the forefront of my mind. I can immediately call to mind the tough stuff, this loss, this difficulty, this affliction. So let's keep reading. He says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them well, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind. Hear this. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Point number two is this. God is not an air fryer. God is not an air fryer. Stick with me, I'll explain. Listen to this writer here, and, and tell me if you've ever felt this way before. He's crying out about how his life is full of bitterness He's weighed down by what he's experienced in his life, and yet in the midst of, of this dark moment, where does he turn? What does he say? He says, my life is in shambles, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. How does he have hope? He says, because the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. And what I want you guys to know and believe with your whole heart today is that no matter what you're battling in this life, you are not consumed because of God's love, because of God's compassions, and they never fail, and they're new every morning. That should be your hope. That is the hope that we have in Jesus. Are you with me? So not under your own strength will you be strong enough to face tomorrow. Not if you're able to get insurance to cover that medication will you be strong enough. Not if that X would just take you back will you be strong enough. Not if you could just have one more drink will that make you strong enough. You will find your strength in the Lord and he will never fail. And then verse 24 says a really important piece of the puzzle. He says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. And we don't like that part, the The waiting. We can get reasonably good at our faith until like, I get it to a place where we can mutter the phrase, like, I trust the Lord. He's so good. And I think we'd like to say those things and then have God like, answer our prayers the next day. But notice the writer here in Lamentations, he says, I had to tell myself. He had to remind himself that the Lord is his portion, that the Lord is his source of happiness and security, purpose, hope, and life. Therefore, I will what? Everybody say, Wait. Therefore, I will wait on the Lord. He had to remind himself of God's goodness and then tell himself again that he has to be patient and wait for the Lord to make a move. I knew that I was entering a new season of my life when I started to get excited about household items. And one of those items is an air fryer. And not just any air fryer, but this one was like sleek and fancy and it could like stay on our countertop as like an everyday appliance. And so just by a show of hands, how many people have an air fryer and use it pretty often? Most of you. All right, now I have two young daughters. So I can take chicken nuggets, dino nuggets, pizza rolls, pizza bagels, Elio's pizza, basically anything that has the name nugget or pizza in it, my kids are eating it. And perhaps the greatest part about having an air fryer is it will sizzle these things up to 400 degrees and they are ready to eat within eight minutes or less. Hallelujah. 
And compared to having to do it in the oven, right, where you got to preheat the oven and then spray the pan or put tin foil down and then put that in the oven and wait and wait and wait like 20 minutes, it's like, I don't have time for that. And that's just an air fryer. But the truth is, is that we do this with a lot of things in our life. We are too busy to wait. We need to get to wherever we need to get to as fast as we can. And sometimes we could treat our relationship with God like this too. Like, like, God, I've been praying about this for a while now. What's taking so long? But the thing is, God is not an God is not an air fryer. He's not. God can do something in a moment, but most of the time, he takes a while to do some things. What I can tell you is that even when he does take a while, he always does it for our own good. He knows that we would just fumble whatever we're asking him to give us right now. And so I can promise you that with God, it is always worth the wait. For some of you here today, I know this could be new to you, right? Maybe you went to church when you were younger, but like this style of church is new to you. Maybe you've heard about Jesus and knew that, like, we celebrate his birthday on Christmas, but you didn't really know anything about him. Maybe you grew up around, like, the rules of religion, but having a relationship with God is foreign to you. Maybe this whole, like, talk about trusting God in hard times seems like a fairy tale to you. What I want you to know more than anything is that your questions and doubts are welcome here. In fact, if you have questions or doubts, I'm so glad that you had the guts to still get up and get yourself to church today. But what I want you to know is that you don't need to completely abandon your doubt in order to have faith. You can have faith and doubt. It doesn't mean that you don't really believe. You can trust God while you're also wrestling with your current situation or circumstance. And I think what all of us can learn today is that sometimes when you're going through a valley in this life, we need to remind ourselves that God is enough and he is worth waiting on. When you have doubt in your heart, sometimes you need to tell yourself to wait on the Lord just like the writer of Lamentations did. So in John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples and he's essentially saying, hey, listen up, I gotta be real with you. I'm gonna be going back to heaven. You can't come with me yet, but I promise that I'm preparing a place for you. And then hopping down to verse 16, Jesus continues and he says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus says, in the meantime, I'm going I'm to go back to heaven. I'm going to ask God to send you an advocate, a helper, a comforter to be with you because you're going to need some help and guidance. And Jesus promises them that the Holy Spirit would live with them and in them. And that same promise, hear me, is true for every believer in Jesus today, that the comforter and the helper, the Holy Spirit, is with you and in you. And so we talked a lot over this series about things being both, that in hard times in life, it could be a place of destruction and reconstruction, that we could be frustrated and faithful, and it applies here too. Because the same place that Jesus sat and had this conversation with his disciples about saying the Holy Spirit, like, woohoo, great news, I'm sending a comforter to be with you. In that same place is where he would also talk to them through his death. And so point number three is take me back to communion. Take me back to communion. At this time, our volunteers are going to come forward. They're going to pass out communion cups. And what I want you to see here is that Jesus was trying to mentally and emotionally prepare the disciples for him going to the cross. But he was also giving them something that they were going to hold on to on the other side of the cross. That same table that Jesus talked to them about the Holy Spirit and his own death, he also said, every time you sit here and you break bread, I want you to remember me. And hear this, Jesus wasn't telling them to remember the good times. He wasn't saying, hey, every time you eat this, I want you to be like, yo, Jesus was so much fun. Remember when he healed that blind man? Remember that time he lowered that guy through the roof and he couldn't walk, but then he could walk because of Jesus? Remember that time we were like going through the crowd and this woman reached out who had been bleeding and she touched him and she was instantly healed? Remember that time that Lazarus was raised from the dead? Remember that wedding that we were at when Jesus turned the water into wine? That was so lit. No, instead, Jesus says, remember me when you break the bread and pour the wine because it's in those moments you will remember the breaking of my body and the pouring out of my blood as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And so we're going to take communion this morning in remembrance of just that. I know many of you grew up in the Catholic Church and you've heard communion referred to as the Eucharist. And if you're anything like me, you have no idea what that word actually meant. And so I looked it up. And it's actually Eucharisteo. And it's this Greek word for what we do. 
The word itself means thanksgiving or to give thanks. And there are actually three recorded occasions where Jesus gave this Eucharistio, where he gave thanks, and each time it was before a miracle. He did it before he fed the 5,000 plus people with five loaves and two fish. He did it before he would raise Lazarus from the dead. And then again, he did it at the Last Supper before he would die on the cross and raise again three days later. So at this time, I'm going to ask that you would join me in taking communion together. And as we do, if someone could bring me one forward, please. As we do, thank you. It's in these moments, even the moments in your life that you're going through right now that maybe you're filled with brokenness, that you could remind yourself to give Eucharisteo, to give thanksgiving toward Jesus. And we could have faith and be grateful because God is faithful in every moment. Wherever you're at today, know that God is near. And so as you pull back that first layer of plastic, you'll find the wafer. And as we take this, we remember and give thanks for Jesus' body that was broken, whipped, and beaten in our place. Before we get to the juice, I just want to say Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him and I never want this time to be like some religious tradition where we take the wafer and drink the juice and don't actually remember. Jesus didn't command eat and have a sip of something at church. He said do this in remembrance of me. So as we do this, please remember that he was beaten. He took the cross and his blood was poured for the forgiveness of all of our sin. And that is why we celebrate, and that's why we get up on a Saturday and get our bus to church every weekend, not because this is some fun community club. It is fun, and we love each other, but that is not why we're here. We are here to worship and learn about the one who gave it all. Let's take the juices we remember here this morning. Jesus, we thank you. for your sacrifice. I pray that the way that we live our lives would be a reflection of how much, how much value we put on that sacrifice because we forget. And Jesus, we're sorry that we forget. We're sorry that we forget the torture that you endured. We're sorry for the most gruesome death that you experienced because of us, for us. And I pray like I said before, the way that we live our lives will just echo your sacrifice. The way that we worship would reveal how much we value your sacrifice. Through the way that we give, it would show the way that we value your sacrifice. Through the way that we serve, through the way that we love others, through the way that we live our life, it would be a reflection of you. Because of your death, when our Heavenly Father looks down from heaven, he no longer sees our sin. He sees his son, and that is good news. So I pray that we would all remember that, carry that with us day after day, that we would start our days remembering who you are and what you've done. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>